Astronomy is probably one of the only subjects that has such a clear line uh, between its ancient roots and its modern um, incarnation. This begins, and that line is drawn with uh, a man named Nicholas Copernicus in the 1500s. What did Copernicus do that was so revolutionary? Well, he brought back an old, old idea. If you remember from my previous lecture, the heliocentric idea, the idea that the planets orbit the sun, had been brought up in ancient Greece by Aristarchus. But the idea had been shot down, um, and, and including for one really good idea, you know, one really good scientific valid argument was that they weren't seeing a shift of the stars that you would expect if the Earth was going around the sun. Of course, we know that's just because the stars are so far away. So in its place, uh, people like Ptolemy tried to come up with geocentric models that were a little bit crazy. But anyway, by the time of the 1500s, it was pretty clear that Ptolemy's model with loop-de-loops, epicycles they're called, wasn't panning out. Something new had to happen. And Copernicus realized that if you just put the sun at the center, you could explain, for example, retrograde motion. You could explain why every once in a while planets appear to drift backwards. That was his great breakthrough. Unfortunately for him, he still didn't have the technology to show why we weren't seeing a parallax shift of the stars. That's a shame because he could have, that would have been just the end of the story right there. But he couldn't do it. Copernicus did make one mistake. He still kept circular orbits. That's a problem. But it's a minor problem. He got the major thing right, the heliocentric idea. Now, Copernicus was about the last person you'd expect to be a revolutionary. He's a very shy man. And um, for that reason, he only published his great book in, in Latin. Why? Because very few people could read it. It was really just sort of an, uh, an in-house debate. And by the way, most of those people that could read it were in the church. At that time, the church basically was the repository of knowledge. I mean, at that point in Europe... Um, that's where all the scholars were, including him. He was actually a canon in the church. He was a member of the church clergy himself. So anyway, so he was trying to keep this sort of almost to himself, but his greatest feat was this, his, his, his great book, De Revolutionibus. Uh, he was so shy, so scared of ridicule, which he knew was coming, um, that he, he pulled a fast one. He decided uh, to die. Yeah, he, he, he actually decided it was better to wait and not publish his book until literally he was on his deathbed. That's how scared he was of ridicule. And But he did. He published it um, as he lay dying. And as expected, there was a lot of criticism. The church essentially didn't like it for a couple reasons. Um, one, again, it kind of hurts our ego, I guess. It makes us not seem as special in God's eyes, I guess, to them. Um, and then another, you know, there were some biblical arguments saying that the, there were passages in the Bible that seemed to suggest, at least to their interpretation, that um, the earth wouldn't be moving. But anyway, Copernicus didn't have to worry about it. It was out there. Now, let's see how this explains retrograde motion. Let's watch here. So now the Earth is on the inside track right when we pass Mars, for example. Look at that. It appears briefly to drift backwards in the sky. That's it. It's so simple. Ptolemy's making up loop-de-loops within loop-de-loops. And uh, let's watch it. Maybe it's on repeat here. Yeah, let's watch it one more time. Look at this. Right when the Earth passes Mars, only during those couple months when we're passing Mars on the inside track, it would make it appear to drift backwards. I was given an analogy in class. It's like you're driving down the highway, and let's say you have a child in the back seat, and you're passing, let's say, a big truck. From their perspective in the back seat, that truck appears to be moving backwards, but that's only because you're moving forward faster than it's moving forward. You notice Earth and Mars never, Mars never actually goes backwards in the sky. It's moving forward the whole time. It's just that we're going forward faster and it's a and it's like an optical illusion it makes it appear to drift backwards and with that simple explanation that long-standing mystery is solved of retrograde motion wow what a time period 
What a time period. You have Copernicus causing a revolution in science. Martin Luther causing a split, a revolution in the church, which will forever be split in the Christian church between Protestant and Catholic. You have the voyages of uh, Magellan and Columbus and the the art of, of Da Vinci and Michelangelo. What an incredible time there in the uh, 1500s in the beginning of the Renaissance. So this chapter, we're going to continue next um, into the next time period. The person that's going to take up Copernicus's cause here is a man named Galileo, one of my favorite people in history to talk about. Uh, after Galileo, we're going to talk about two gentlemen together, Tycho, Brahe, and Kepler, who literally worked together. So we're going to talk about them together, and then we'll move on to Mr. Newton himself, and that's how we'll kind of, that's where we're going to end this sort of history chapter. Uh, but let's let's talk a little bit about Galileo, one of the most interesting figures in human history, in my opinion. Um, Galileo, to me, what makes him so incredible, he was modern in so many ways. He was a modern scientist, first of all. What makes him modern? Unlike the Greeks who sat around in their togas and discussed everything, okay, we would call them really philosophers, uh, not scientists. Yeah, they were discussing scientific matters of heliocentric versus geocentric, but Galileo, he's actually conducting experiments to find out what's true and what isn't. That makes him very modern. Now, his most famous experiment, well, first of all, he actually, if you're taking physics, uh, you can thank Galileo for the field of kinematics. He had a he developed the, the basic laws of, of, of motion of objects traveling in a straight line. And he had like a series of ramps. He would roll a marble down the ramp and he had some bells and they would go off. And he figured out the relationship between distance and velocity and acceleration and time. So that's that in itself was a pretty incredible contribution. His most famous experiment, though. Uh, his most famous discovery as far as physics goes, this is that all objects fall at the same rate. Now that, at first glance, is not common sense at all. Now just so you know, back in ancient times, Aristotle had said, for example, that an object twice as heavy would fall twice as fast. Uh, we know that's not true at all. But how did Galileo prove this? Well, the legend has it that he would go up in the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That may pro That's probably not actually true. He may have just talked about it in his classroom. Uh, as a professor. But anyway, uh, legend has it he'd go up in the Leaning Tower of Pisa and take two differently weighted balls and drop them and show that they'd hit the ground at the same time. But there's a catch to this. The catch is this. Objects fall at the same rate in the absence of air. If there's no air, okay, well, there's air around you all the time. Otherwise, you're in some trouble. You're not going to be breathing, right? So we're, we're not used to that. If you drop a, a hammer and a feather, in the classroom, guess what? The hammer's going to hit first, but that's only because it's able to slice through the air much faster than the feather. So you have to factor in air resistance. Now, where would be a good place to demonstrate this? A place that has gravity, but no air? Well, the perfect place would actually be the moon. And so I'm really happy that they did this on Apollo 15. Let's watch if you can see this at all. It's very grainy. How about that? Pretty awesome. A hammer and a feather. Doesn't matter what you drop, they fall at the same rate. Pretty cool. In the absence of air. But of course, when you think of Galileo, again, that was probably his greatest contribution in, in physics. But when you think of Galileo, there's probably one thing that comes to mind. The telescope. Now, 
for historical accuracy here. Galileo did not invent the telescope. It was invented by a man named Lippershe in Holland. But Lippershe was using it um, almost more like a toy. And uh, Galileo heard about it and immediately thought, aha, I want to make one of these things. I think we can do more with it than what's being done. And so um, Galileo was the first person to use a telescope for science purposes. And for the record, Galileo himself didn't use it for astronomy purposes for, for months. Yeah, for three or four months, he actually was using it. He was thinking more along the lines of using it as a military tool which it was, which it was. I mean, you could see, if you can see the enemy ships coming before they see you, and when I say telescope at that time, I want you to think of like a, a pirate movie, like a pirate up in the crow's nest, and they've got this little tube with a piece of glass at each end. That's what we're talking about. Very simple, very low magnification, probably very poor quality. But anyway, Galileo, the other thing that makes him modern, number one, he conducts experiments, and number two, he embraces technology, just like we do in modern times right? We all embrace technology. Everybody looks forward to the next generation of um, smartphone that comes out. Okay. Smart appliances and things like that. We're hooked on it. Galileo, I think would fit in very nicely. So what do you think he looked at the first night he thought, and this was in December of 1609, when he first thought to take his telescope outside, what do you think he looked at? Well, he looked at the moon and immediately he knew that he had just overturned about 2,000 years of uh, Aristotle's thoughts on the subject because Aristotle said things in the heavens had to be perfectly smooth, for example. Uh, the moon, the last thing I would call it is smooth, right? He's seeing craters and mountains. By the way, he, he did experiments. He actually started calculating on paper how tall the mountains were on the moon. He knew this was something that was, wasn't some magical you know, thing in the heavens that was different than the earth. These were things that you see on the earth, canyons and mountains and things. That is a major, huge change in thinking. So what does he do the next morning? Well, he gets up and he looks at the sun with his telescope. That's not a good idea, by the way. He had no kind of filter. Um, a lot of people think that this is why he went blind later in life. Um, that's kind of inconclusive. We're not sure about that, but one way or the other, it's a bad idea, but he was the first human being ever to see sunspots on the sun. Now, what does this have to do with Aristotle? Well, it means Aristotle was wrong about the sun as well. It has, if you want to call them blemishes, that totally is against the philosophy of Aristotle. Now he's the first person to notice that the sun rotates because those sunspots rotate around. He noticed night or day after day that the sunspots were moving and he could calculate the sun's rotation. I think his greatest discovery though was on the night of January 7th, 1610. And that was the night he discovered Jupiter's moons, Jupiter's, at least he eventually discovered Jupiter's four large moons, which today are still called the Galilean moons. On that first night, he discovered three of them. And that, that's, that's a picture right there on the screen from his notebook. So there's Jupiter, the big circle and the little stars there are actually the moons. And he notices that they're doing something pretty special. They are orbiting Jupiter. If they are orbiting Jupiter, that means they are not orbiting the earth. And right there, he finally has proof um, that the geocentric theory is bogus, that things don't have to orbit around the Earth. And anybody could see that with a telescope. Later on, he was looking at the faces of Venus and once again figured out that the only way that would happen, because you see like a half, you know, Venus, half of the, the face of it, and then later you see a crescent Venus. The only way that makes sense is if Venus is orbiting the sun. That was huge. He just proved the heliocentric theory. Now, unlike Copernicus, who was shy, Galileo was anything but shy. He published his books in Italian so everybody could read them. His most famous one, The Starry Messenger, revolutionary. Later, the one that really he got in trouble for uh, was called The Dialogue. The church had kind of told him to back off at that point, and being Galileo, he didn't. This led to him uh, being condemned by the church and going on trial, and uh, because he was an old man at that point and going blind, they just put him under house arrest. Uh, kind of a sad ending for Galileo. There he is showing, there's, there's Galileo there as a young man. You rarely see that showing the Doge of Venice, how his telescope works. And here was me uh, getting to hold and actually a replica of that, which was cool. Same day I met this guy actually, which was really awesome. And anyway, that's a little bit about Galileo.